Hi. So continuing on with this theme of how words can change, one of the biggest sort of mechanisms of change in language having to do with taboo words is the euphemism treadmill. Uh, we talked about this a little bit when we talked about euphemisms themselves. And we'll go into it a little more detail of how that can lead to language change. So, again, the idea of it is that you begin with a euphemistic substitute. So at this point, it's not a full-fledged euphemism according to our definitions because it hasn't become conventionalized. It hasn't become a full-fledged member of the, the language, part of the lexicon. It, it's something that was created on the fly as a way of substituting for some dysphemism. Um, but at this point, we don't want to say that it, it is a, a conventional or arbitrary decision there. But at some point, it becomes conventionalized. It becomes part of the lexicon. We memorize this as being a common substitute for such and such a dysphemism. Then it becomes a euphemism. And over time, it may become you know, just simply part of the language. It becomes an orthophemism. I would say, for example, that's what happened with P, right? So P has become just a kind of a normal way of referring to pissing, urinating, without being taboo about it. And we no longer think of it as, as being, you know, a, a euphemism for piss. Most of us don't think of it as being that first letter, that abbreviation. We just think of it as um, the typical word that we would use to talk about it. On the other hand, we also see that euphemisms can, over time, become dysphemisms, that, that they become taboo. And that's also a common process, and we're going to see some examples of that in just a moment. And we also can see some flux here, where orthophemisms, given enough time, may actually become taboo. And likewise, dysphemisms, given enough time, may actually become okay become just a normal way of saying it. So it can go both ways. All right, now, some examples. Um, euphemisms may become too closely associated with the word or meaning of the word they replace, and they become dysphemisms. Dick, for example. Cock, pussy. All of these began as just ways of, of substituting for whatever the taboo word was, whatever the dysphemism was, but what happened was that, given enough time, they became taboo themselves. Now, I think arguably they're losing some of their tabooness, especially Dick, which it really isn't that strong of a taboo anymore. Uh, a number of people have noted, for example, that TV shows more and more feel comfortable using Dick to refer to penis, um, not as the, the nickname for Richard, but as a, a term for penis. Um, informatively, and nobody seems to object to it, or, or fewer people, I should say, object to it than used to. Cock may be somewhat more taboo, although that may be losing some of its tabooness as well. And then there's pussy. Now, I think pussy is probably the easiest one to see how that became a euphemism. This was just simply a metaphoric euphemism. Um, you know, I. I won't go into any detail, but hopefully you can use your own imagination to think about how uh, the, the female genitalia could remind somebody of a cat, and thus pussy became a euphemism, and over time it became taboo in its own right, so that people now avoid it. Cock is more complicated, and we'll come back to cock uh, a little bit later and go over exactly how cock came to be the, uh, a term, the, the, the euphemistic term that it did, the euphemism that it did, and then eventually became taboo itself. That part, the, the latter part, is easy uh, through the euphemism treadmill. Why a male chicken became a cock, you know, cock, the, the male chicken term, how that became a term that meant informatively penis, that's a little more complicated to understand, and we'll talk about that uh, in a later presentation in this series. Okay, so over time, euphemisms may become too closely associated with the word, 
An example of that would be ass. Ass probably began as a euphemism for arse. Um, this was especially in artless dialects that it was, uh, you know, that it would make sense, and eventually took over for the word in the United States. And we talked about that in a previous presentation. This is also a common process among PC terms. Um, I talked about that with Cretan, how that originated as a, as a PC term to refer to mentally disabled people, and eventually it became a taboo slur of sorts. Um, so we, we see this process getting happening over and over again. Lame was the term for a physically disabled person, but over time that became too uncomfortable, and so then people started saying crippled. That became too uncomfortable, so then people started saying handicapped, and that became too uncomfortable. So that today, disabled is the term that seems to be getting used, but you find that some people are uncomfortable with that and refer to them as differently abled. See the same thing with terms for African Americans. Colored was the term for a while, the PC term, then Negro, then Black. Black today is still acceptable, that, but African American might be considered more PC, more, uh, you know, a, a better term, um, more polite. And then we see start people of color starting to take over as well. Um, we see this also with terms for, of war. So, sh so this concept that we've got today of post-traumatic stress disorder that gets talked about a lot today that term started in the Vietnam War, but the concept didn't start there. In the Korean War, it was called operational exhaustion. And by the time of Vietnam War, that seemed to have too many negative um, feelings about it, and so they turned to post-traumatic stress disorder. And then in World War II, before operational exhaustion, there was battle fatigue. And before battle fatigue, there was shell shock. And even today, we're taking it a step further, so that now, instead of calling it post-traumatic stress disorder, many people now refer to it as PTSD, um, using an abbreviation, which we've seen as a common euphemistic process. This is one, this is one that I, I find very interesting. Um, and, and I see this, you know, that I actually talk to a lot of people who've only taken, say, a high school French course. And if you ask them about Bézé, they think it means something different. But to a speaker of French, Bézé is actually a fairly taboo word. You wouldn't go about branding it around. But most people who have taken high school French think it means just simply to kiss. And you've got the term bees, the noun, which still means kiss today, and that's perfectly fine. Or the kind of cutesy version of bisou is fine as well. But Beze is not. Even though that was the originally the, the term, now there again you have this euphemism which started as a, you know, a cutesy way of talking about having sex, of avoiding the more taboo term for it. Um, you know, that's the, the um, conditional one, where if you kiss that might lead to something further. Um, but over time, Beze became too associated with this taboo idea, and it became taboo itself. All right. I think that's. Oh, wait, we've got a few more. So, um, Spanish embarazada meant means pregnant, but it originally meant encumbered, and it replaced the earlier preñado and encinta because they encinta because they were too uncomfortable. Um, we also, by the way, got the word, English word embarrass from the same place um, that Spanish got embarazada. And it's interesting that even our word pregnant was originally a uh, euphemism and it became an orthophemism in English. So this is an example of terms becoming, you know, starting as euphemisms and becoming orthophemisms, and the orthophemisms like preñada and encinta, encinta becoming too taboo to continue using. Um, we often find that terms of foreign or, or technical origin, 
they begin as euphemisms and then they become the orthophemism like derriere, copulation, perspire, urinate, prophylactic, feces, penis, vagina, oops, sorry, uh, merda and merda and chaisa. I think one of the most interesting of all, though, is vagina, which, and this is a, a great, you know, uh, party conversation. Uh, the conversation starts to, to get a little dull. Just to introduce this little uh, bit of, of trivia that vagina and vanilla come from the same origins. They both begin with the Proto Indo European word wog, wog, which meant to break or split or bite, um, came to mean a sheath made of split pieces of wood in Latin, and doesn't take too much imagination to see how a metaphoric euphemism from that would lead to vagina. Um, but at the same time, it also led to vanilla, because vanilla, little sheath, um, looks basically the pod of the vanilla plant looks like a sheath. And vagina, again, but metaphorically, reminds people of a sheath. Vulva also let, has a whole lot of related words. This is another bit of trivia that you can share, that vulva and waltz come from the same word, as does walk, um, well, wallow, wallet, vault, evolve, involve, revolve, veil, helen, helix, helicopter, all of those are related to vulva. All of them come from the same ancestral, ancestral word in proto indo european which means to turn or to roll. Um, so you get some kind of interesting things where these euphemisms end up kind of coming out of nowhere from our modern perspective. So these two orthophemisms began as euphemisms um, as a way of avoiding the more uncomfortable terms, and we've got a, a whole bunch of other words that are related to them in surprising ways. All right, that does it for this presentation, um, and we'll continue on a little more with the next one.